We're in lockdown at school. I thought we'd uh, just put on a movie real quick and uh, we'll just wait out this uh, shooting. Uh, we're gonna watch uh, D uh, Die Hard in the high school. Hollywood wouldn't be dumb enough to make that movie, would they? Not made by Hollywood. Made in Texas by a guy named Dallas. Can I get up and go put the movie on? Ow. Now I'm gonna take my pants off. Take them off my pants. Doing it quick. Taking off my pants. In between breath, take the shot. Is that Chris Jellick over there? Is he doing something completely weird? Senior prank day. But we'll see all kinds of dumb stuff today. Swim captain, we'll have Thai food delivered to class. This is high school. Nothing that happens here matters in the real world. Pull out whichever app you use to do live streaming video. Get them up and running and point it at me. Now! Get back to your homeroom and stay put until... Is it safe to say that this might be our guardian angel? Well, looks like we're gonna be in lockdown for a while. So, uh, go into the uh, trusty old backpack. So, we open the movie on Zoe. Her dad, Mickey Mantle, big penis man, is teaching her how to hunt. And she shoots a deer, but it's not dead. And so dad's like, all right, Zoe, so circle of life, you know, put animals out of their misery and you think, oh, they're gonna like shoot it. The animal will die a natural death. <laughs> With that process comes extreme pain. And will suffer for it. Doesn't even wanna hear his fucking bullshit speech. Smashes its brains open. So right away, this girl, sociopath. Uh, something not right with her. And by the way, this is a not save the cat moment. This is a kill the dog moment, uh, which they did in the very beginning of House of Cards. So this girl is basically Kevin Spacey. We learned that her mom recently died because her mom will just pop in like as a character and they'll talk and this happens like every 20 minutes, which is like, oh, it's a stylistic choice. She's not really like hallucinating, right? Aren't we getting close to seeing your prom? I mean it, stop. Stop what? This isn't style. The movie's saying she really does like talk to her mom like this. The way I really want. Jesus, you hear voices too. Zoe has a black friend and he wants more, but she's a frigid bitch and doesn't want, you know, cause her mom died recently. So she's closed off. But by the end of the film, which is like 10 hours later, she's opened up and learned and now they're in love and they're all happily ever after. Spoiler alert, I guess. Uh, also, this is senior prank day slash prom posal day. I didn't know prom posals were on a certain day. So anyway, there's about 15 minutes of like high school shenanigans. School shooting starts. Let's go. You're being really weird. So the school shooters, the bad guys, there's four of them, which immediately know. Like once in a while, you get two weirdo loner incels like a Columbine where they work together. Most part of it, it's a one loner weirdo. This, the people who do these are loner weirdos. And so there's a leader and he's like charismatic and like gives speeches. And it's like, no, you sh and he has a girlfriend. One of them's his girlfriend. It's like, you show me a rebellious, charismatic 18 year old dude who wants to like be rebellious. He's rebelling by skipping school and fucking his hot girlfriend, right, Matt Walsh? Not shooting up the school. Trigger warning. They start by crashing a van into the cafeteria and then they're just like blowing people away, lots of shooting. Uh, and then they like barricade it, we're taking the hostages. Then they whip out all kinds of electronics and like banks of screens, police scanners. They're monitoring all the TV networks. So like FNN, the fucking news network, they got that, they're watching that. So then you're like, this isn't just like, sort of die hard in a school. This is just die hard in a school. This main character, the main bad guy, Tristan Hans Gruber. So join me as we dismantle a bastion of our society in favor of entropy and truth. He's dating a girl, Anna. Her brother, Chris, hears voices. Kip, the big chubby weirdo who was bullied. So there's your four crew, charismatic dude, hot girlfriend, Dude who hears voices, bully kid. It's like, oh, we're just gonna have all of them working together. Sure, if that makes sense. It's not that hard to build a wall. Tristan. And this team of four is incredibly competent, right? They have all kinds of plans. They start off by starting fires all over like their small town. When they get hostages, the kids, they make them all like pull their phones out and they're like, all right, everybody start streaming us. They're live streaming us. So they're trying to get as many viewers as they can so that Tristan Hans Gruber can start giving his speeches, hamming it up, trying to become a celebrity, I guess. 
At first, I would like to give a quick shout out to the tech giants hosting these video streams. Turn them off or in any way interrupt them and we will be forced to kill everybody immediately. So the news networks, I'll put them live on the air because that would happen. So while they're doing this, Anna goes and starts like just cutting wires, just like uh, cutting this. She's She knows how to cut every like uh, fire alarm. She knows how to shut that off. Inter shut down parts of the internet, but like the kids are still streaming. So is that the Wi-Fi? I don't know. F phones. I, she's cutting all kinds of things. So let's back up. Van crashes into building. You shoot a bunch of people. You're taking hostages. Now you're getting the live streams up. You're starting to do your speeches. Nobody outside of the cafeteria knows this is happening. Every other classroom, they're just sitting there. They don't know anything's going on. Front desk, nobody knows. It's like in real life, sure you might round up some of the kids in the cafeteria, but half the kids in the cafeteria are running, are scattering, they're screaming down every hallway, they're pulling fire alarms, dialing 911, texting, they're snapchatting each other, last I'm dying, dick pics, cats and dogs living together, total chaos. <laughs> But no, not one kid dials 911. Like 20 minutes go by, and even they're live streaming it. That's great, who has more than 100 live viewers? How many do you have? Just one over a thousand. And meanwhile, the other kids in the school, none of them have noticed this is happening. It's like, who are these, who's following his video? So then we, we start to learn the theme of the film, which is absolutely everyone, with a few exceptions, is horribly incompetent or stupid or lazy. Trigger warning. So Zoe, main character, badass. She witnesses this. She's in like the bathroom though. And so she can like hide. And then she's like escaping. You guessed it, crawling through the ceiling. She gets out multiple close up. Uh, that, that person got killed, but uh, I escaped. She pulls the fire alarm. Relax. Right, it's early, but not unexpected. What the hell are you doing, Missy? Think that I have a pass here For somewhere. the electrical room? Nobody but me is allowed in it. So yeah, he's got timetables on when fire alarms get pulled, and it's like 20 something minutes after it starts. It's like, no, bro, it, this would be 30 seconds after you crash into the building. Okay. And he's got all these plans and like electronics and oh, this will happen now and then the cops will be distracted by this. It's like, okay, you look at real life school shootings, these weirdos, they have grandiose plans because this is basically just a masturbation power fantasy. Columbine, they made pipe bombs that didn't work. They tried to make a giant propane tank bomb, didn't work. Their, their end goal was to like escape the school, steal a plane and crash into a building. No, but these kids, all their plans basically work. Like they're super competent. Everybody else is an idiot. I will take a large Hawaiian pizza. Easy on the cheese, please, as I am dairy sensitive. <laughs> when the girl, Anna, goes to like cut the power or something, she should be like, mm, I know it's a cut. And it's up, I'll execute myself. The administrators won't issue a lockdown because they can't until they verify it. So the principal has to like waddle down to the cafeteria and be like, hey, are you shooting up the school in here? And he gets shot. And they're like, all right, I guess it's verified. So we just wasted 30 minutes. Let's issue the lockdown now. And then the lady. Attention faculty and students, we are in lockdown. I repeat, we are in lockdown. Please consult your school safety manuals for instructions as we are in lockdown until further notice. She didn't give any information. You could have said, there's active shooter in the cafeteria. No, like if you would have heard that, you'd have gone, oh, this is like a drill maybe. So pubescent Hans Gruber, uh, Hans Puber, he, uh, he kills the principal, and then there's the school security guard. Literally pisses himself because he's unarmed. He doesn't have a gun, little bitch. Literally pees his pants and runs away. This is what security guards are good for. All right. Okay, we're starting to see a little bit of an agenda here. 19 minutes into the film, the attack begins. 43 minutes in is when they finally go into lockdown. So the cops, they finally get called, uh, but they're all stuck in traffic because Hans Puber started fires around the town and that distracts all the cops with traffic jams caused by fire trucks again we're in like a small town how much traffic is this causing i don't all right sure if this is more of a hostage situation than an active shooter then we contain negotiate and wait for the lead team the swat team's an hour away because the super competent school shooters swatted something else i'm glossing over many kills here Call your loved one. Tell, talk to your loved one. You're like to the lunch lady. And she's like, hi, honey. And then they blow her away. Things like that. Very fun. 
Very fun, right? This is a very fun film. And when they shoot people, fucking three gallons of blood fly on the wall. Her bodies go flying, all right? This feels like a Tarantino movie. It feels like uh, Edgar Wright. It's like hot fuzz. Silly, over the top, four gallons of blood. This would fit in in like a horror comedy. I don't know that it would fit in Die Hard. Do they do that in Die Hard? Trigger warning. <laughs> You should be ashamed. So A, it's completely unrealistic. B, it's an incredibly poor taste. It's like, sure, you're making a zombie movie, you know, fine. But to do this in this like too real, too soon, not fun film. It's like putting Tarantino action into Schindler's List. All right, it's that stupid. So Zoe escapes again, and she's running to like go to classrooms and be like, hey, run there's a school shooting and they're like oh this is a senior prank shut up and like close the window in her face no break a window there's a school shooting you need and they're like but we're in lockdown it's like no you guys need to run like but we're in lockdown we have to stay put because we're in lockdown she's like no you got they're gonna come you're sitting ducks you need to to evacuate and like, but the protocol we're not supposed to leave until the office announces no, that no, it's over understand. there is no office anymore <laughs> And even when she's like convinces teachers like, all right, break the window. Everybody just fucking run for it, run for the woods. And they're like, all right. The students are like, oh, okay. I guess we're gonna go run for the woods now. All right. Go, go this way. All right, let's go this way. That's their goddamn energy level. They're almost zombies. Maybe it's a zombie comedy. I don't know. I don't care what the protocol is. If I think I can escape and I can get my students to escape, we're fucking escaping. Like, I'm not waiting for instruction. So this is saying like teachers are incompetent and they're just like, well, until the intercom tells me what to do, I'm just gonna sit here. Zoe goes full action hero mode. She's personally involved in killing or disarming every single one of the four bad guys. At one point, she's pretending to be dead. And she's lying there and the bad guy, one of the bad guys like steps on her hand to like check to see if she's dead and she stays perfectly silent. So add that to her list of superhero skills. What's another skill every super badass uh, John McClane has? You get shot somewhere, but ain't no big deal. Ain't no big thing. She gets shot in the thigh. Oh no, mm, tie something down. I'm good, rest of the movie. Breastfeeding mom you. was a, no, it was a nightmare. And then she'll like run faster than most of the students who are like, oh, there's a shooting. Okay, let's walk slowly. She knows engines, she knows guns. She can improvise weapons out of anything. Uh, bombs, yeah, she knows those. At one point, Zoe uh, uses just like one of those shitty lockers as cover, and it's stopping, I think, nine millimeter bullets, which is no, that's not. <laughs> just like in Die Hard, kill a bad guy, get their walkie talkie, and then like talk to the big bad, uh, just like in Die Hard. She makes contact with the cops outside and says like, whoever's the cop on the scene in the parking lot. And they're like, oh, we got someone on the inside, which makes no fucking sense in this. You remember that friend I was telling you about, the one that saved all of our asses? He's calling from inside. Toss it, let's go. There's hundreds of students inside the school with cell phones. So why is it a big deal that you got Zoe on the phone? It's like if in Die Hard, there were 50 off-duty cops loose in the building. The cops just hang out in the parking lot and don't go in and like set up a perimeter, even though it's been standard operating procedure since Columbine to like go in, don't wait in the parking lot. And after Uvalde, it's like, yeah, cops are pretty useless. Hey, look at that. It's a good guy with a gun being goddamn useless. The big bad, Hans Puber, he asks a girl if she believes in God. So we're just like referencing Columbine directly. So that's neat. Do you believe in God? Yes. Why would God let something like this happen to you? God allows the wicked to do their wickedness. Oh yeah, why is that? So they can be judged. He goes to the Spanish class and finds the hot Spanish teacher and makes her like show her boobies. And we see them. Now I'm not normally on the side of don't show the boobies, but in a like fucking depressing, too real, too soon kind of thing, maybe don't show the boob. Like you're glorifying the mass shooters. Hey kids, go take a gun to school and be like, hey, hot girl, you show me your boobies. Hey, hot teacher, you show me your boobies. And you get to see all their boobies. Like, really? We're gonna show that? Tristan, please hey, don't. Hey, por favor. Miss Nunez, this is a Spanish speaking classroom. Good idea. Great fucking idea. 
people from Texas. So who else is fucking incompetent? Uh, the media. And we're failure could cost hey, them their hey, lives. Hey, 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 don't put the school in the shot for a few minutes. I'm happy to not show the school. Well, good, I appreciate that. Please Thank you. Give me something better to point our camera at. Give me something better to point the camera at. Because I'm a dick. The sheriff is like, all right, I'm gonna do a call. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna phone up Hans Puber. You film me, and on TV, we get a nice side-by-side. -side, Cause remember, they're, they're like live streaming it from inside. So we got the live view of Tristan. We've got the live view of the sheriff. And on TV, right on fucking News Network, right on FNN, you get to see this like hostage negotiation call. Cause that would happen. If they really even like did this, there's no way this audio is synced. Travis Kelsey gives a speech and there he's on a delay, but you're telling me if I could school shooters, you're going live. And we are behind, so I'm gonna take this group down. You go collect more. We're the number one trending topic online. About damn time. And remember, it's senior prank day. So there's like a surprise slip and slide. So Zoe, running from a school shooter, uses that. They filled the teacher's lounge with balloons. God damn it, I couldn't get my coffee. I filled fucking balloon. And so she like hides in there and then we have a fight in this like balloon ball pit kind of thing. Both of these are like, oh, that's kind of clever and interesting and something silly in a goofy action comedy. Let's do a fun mashup, you know, like Shaun of the Dead, but it's COVID. That could be fun. So Zoe kills the bad girl. The girl, the girlfriend. She then captures Kip, the chubby weirdo. So Kip just like basically turns the camera and is like, Sixth grade, Chloe Poole and AJ Turner sneak up and pull my pants down in front of assembly. And then everyone in the school saw my tiny penis and that's why I'm a school shooter. All right, movie, you're being like anti-bullying, oh, I guess. Okay, except Zoe then dresses him down. <laughs> about how nobody remembers that. He remembers it vividly, but like everybody else basically has forgotten it. And so he's like projecting. So if people are laughing, he's projecting on them. They're laughing at him when they're maybe just la laughing at something else. Everyone laughed at me naked. So it's actually not really that anti-bullying. It's more like, just get over it, you fucking bitch. Is that anti-bullying? That's more like the bullied are choosing to fixate on it. You ever think that the people you heard giggling were happy? And maybe teachers with no idea which words were triggering you just didn't want to see you flunk? Is it pro-therapy? Except if it was pro-therapy, it'd be like, all right, this happened and it has scarred you emotionally. So if you did years of therapy, she captures him, he's cuffed, she has his gun and she talks to him for like two minutes. Well, you're gonna be remembered forever as that chubby weirdo with a tiny dick, sorry. But if you kill Tristan, you'll become a hero because it'll be on film. That's like, yeah, but isn't there also video of him shooting innocents on the live stream? She lets him go and hands him a gun. So Zoe, let's add to her list of skills. Given about a minute and a half, she can psychoanalyze a school shooter and turn him into a good guy with a gun. I mean, isn't that great? She, she captures a school shooter takes his gun, talks to him for 90 seconds, gives him his gun back, lets him free, and he goes to be a good guy now. And that doesn't backfire hilariously. If you're ever in a school shooting situation, kids, just try talking to him. You know, you really just like talk him out of it. Very good advice. Right now, right now, you are just a sad, fat kid. Everyone in the world will hate. Do you want that to be your legacy? Come on. He's like, Zoe. You have to come to the cafeteria and surrender right now, or I'm gonna execute a hostage every five minutes, starting now. <laughs> Off's one, okay. So Zoe surrenders to the cafeteria. All right, here I am, I'm surrendering. And then Kip shows up, cause he's a good guy with a gun now. And he tries to shoot Tristan, and there's like a shootout and Kip dies in that. But she grabs, Zoe grabs her black friend and like gets him out of there and they're in love now. Back to dad, Thomas Jane, Mickey Mantle big penis guy, right? He's out at the perimeter the cops have, and he's like, my kid's in there. But the cops are spending all their time like keeping the parents out, which again makes you think of Uvalde. What would any parent do? Well, he goes and gets his hunting rifle and he sets up a nice little sniper's nest on the edge of the school grounds. I don't know how nobody notices him do this. The cops are apparently not going in. They're setting up a perimeter and waiting. They're spending energy keeping parents out. Don't notice a sniper. Zoe gets in a fight in like a chemistry room and she uses 
chemistry as a weapon just immediately because she's like fucking Walter White. Add that to her list of skills. And then bad guy. Ugh. That's exactly what they told me you'd say. <laughs> Way to go, dad. Okay, so dad is sniping into the school. Those cops, I don't care. They're not stopping to tell who, wait, who is this guy? There's a dude shooting into the school. They're in the middle. There's like four shooters. We don't know what's going on. They're mag dumping in his general direction. Like dad is dead 30 seconds later. All the windows and all the rooms and all of the gin joints, he just has the perfect shot to save her at the perfect time. Like, oh my God. In a cliche, action movie it's dumb fine whatever but in this like we have something to say about the issue of school shootings kind of film you're just telling parents to go fucking snipe into schools great fucking advice for parents good job that's not gonna get anybody killed all right breastfeeding mom wasn't no it was a nightmare so what happens at the end of die hard there's bomb it's gonna be a diversion right and they escape oh look at that and even when the diversion bomb doesn't work one of the bad guys, who you thought was dead for sure earlier, comes back and is like in the crowd outside. Oh my God. And then, yeah. So there's a bomb in the van, of course. And Zoe's the one who discovers this. And how much time is on the clock? A few minutes? No, 40 seconds. Get out now, Katie. He's gone. Go. There's a bomb in there. Go, go, please. Bomb disposal. She knows that. All right. So SWAT storms the school and they're very competent, right? They kill a bunch of bad guys. No, they just like tackle Zoe, zip tie her and then like get blown up or something. SWAT is like, yeah, we got the bad guy. He burnt to a crisp and we didn't see it happen. So like, oh, so he's definitely not dead. And then uh, Zoe sees someone in a crowd and he's like wearing a hat. And that's very suspicious wearing a hat. So she follows him and it's, it's Tristan, Hans Puberty. He's escaping. This kid walks off into the woods to his hidden cache with piles of money and a passport. It's like, who the fuck is this kid? I'm pretty sure earlier we saw where he lives and it was like a trailer. Where the fuck is he getting cash and all these electronics and... Roger that. Miss Boy! He's shooting up a school live on the internet, but giving me his number will violate his privacy. So Zoe notices that he's escaping. What does she do? Go tell one of the hundred cops, hey, that's the shooter. No. She hunts him down, personally. I'm gonna go hunt, hunt this man myself. And uh, she doesn't have a gun, so what does she do? Well, remember dad sniped at the school and then he got arrested. The very competent police left his gun and just put like caution, warning, crime scene tape stuff around it and left it there. And no one's there. No one's watching it. So she just like sneaks over there. Oh, I got dad's gun now. All right, I'm gonna go do some sniping. And then Snipe, you know, shoots him from a distance, which he is no threat to her. She's not law enforcement. You can't just do vigilante justice just because he's a school shooter. He's not, I don't think he's armed at this point. He doesn't know you're there. He's running away and you're sniping him. I'm pretty sure Zoe's committing murder at the end of the film. Cool, good message. What a message. Just like the deer. He's not dead. He's like bleeding out. See, it's tempting to let nature run its course. The lungs will fill with blood and the animal will die. And it just isn't right to let it suffer. <laughs> Which this is the key to having an ending that seems like it's meaningful. Just have it be an echo of the beginning of the film. It's like nostalgia for like 80 minutes ago. People love nostalgia. But then she throws it not on his head, which is like, why? He doesn't know you're doing a bit. Only we know you're doing the bit. Why would you even do the bit? You could have just stood over and been like, I could put you out of your misery, but I'm not going to. Instead, you're like, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to deliver this speech. Like, I'm going to do this, and then I'm not going to. Like, what? So she's delivering one-liners and doing callbacks to earlier kills. Well, that's really cool. So she is, like, letting him bleed out, walks away, and then the cops... They're like, hey, what? what's going on over there? And it's like, she sniped at him. 
while being like, I don't know, 40 yards away from the school. Like, the, she's, she's walking back a very short distance. Cops are like, what? What's going on? And the movie really treats Zoe as if she's gonna be like remembered as this great hero. There's this bit about Tristan thinks he's gonna be like remembered. And after all your goddamn hard work, people aren't gonna remember you. They're gonna remember me. So it seems like she's gonna become this like glorified hero, school shooter stopper, and she's gonna become a media sensation or something. And she killed a guy, murdered a guy. Justifiable, maybe. Maybe uh, no court's gonna convict her. Oh, because, uh, all right. So this is really like giving me vibes of like how the right sees Kyle Rittenhouse. Like, yeah, justifiable shooter. Let's make him a big hero. It's like, really? So this film purporting to have something to say for the national discussion about school shootings is just like, yeah deliver one-liners and kill the bad guys and we'll make you a hero vigilante superhero and dad snipe the school like this is what we're offering to the fucking discussion about school shootings so to summarize zoe's skills here's what i got hunting any gun she finds she can use it immediately can improvise weapons out of anything like a fire extinguisher or just some chemicals or a slip and slide balloons knows how to use those for uh, a tactical advantage she knows car engines psychology hostage negotiation she never panics even when she's shot in the leg bombs going off in 40 seconds yeah i know how to deal with this Hunt, hunting a man the most dangerous delivering one-liners that's the message of the film be zoe mclean kill the bad guys deliver the one-liners and limit the body count to just 21 including the bad guys although she turned kip into a good guy i guess so is that three bad or four bad get shot once but just once and then power through it like mahomes on a high ankle sprain Deliver one-liners when you triumphantly kill the bad guy at the end, and then you get the trophy girl slash guy at the end. You get the you get the love interest. That's the message America needs right now, right? This is what we need for our national conversation about school shootings. I will say, Isabel May, the lead actress, she's pretty good. Uh, most of the acting's pretty good. Most of the film is basically competently made. Like, looks like a movie. Good effects. It's just you guys failed at the premise level. There are, you know a thousand people that work on a movie and 999 of them did their jobs and the one who didn't was the like producer or writer or somebody who was like you know what this would be a good idea trigger warning so who made this crap well let me introduce you to dallas saunier uh who's from dallas and named dallas although dallas isn't really his name it's his nickname just imagine being from Dallas and being like, yeah, call me Dallas. What an asshole. Anyway, he was an agent in Hollywood, but he didn't like how liberal it was. So he left and went back to Dallas to start his own film, an indie film studio called Cinestate. Quote, it can be a little hard to pin Sonier down ideologically. He considers himself libertarian leaning. Uh, there's an old joke. Libertarians are just uh, Republicans that like weed. It's not cool to be a Republican. Cinestate is backed by an anonymous Texas oil heiress, Dallas says, to produce populist entertainment. The industry is using platforms such as the Academy Awards to rail against the Trump administration that has alienated many moviegoers. And today, those are the people Mr. Sonnier has in mind. His audience he has in mind is Trump supporters libertarian got it if we can make a movie that does not treat them as losers or ask how dare they vote a certain way or pander to them naturally they're going to respond in a positive way so he's gonna pander to trump supporters is his plan that's his business plan it sounds like he says he wrote in a candidate during the 2016 election because he lost respect for donald trump following the access hollywood tape so he says if we can make a movie that does not treat them as losers or ask how dare they vote for trump meanwhile he was like, I want Republicans to win, but I also like, God, I can't vote for Trump. What the fuck? I guess I'll write in, I don't know, Ron Paul or some shit. But movies shouldn't then say to Trump voters, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Hollywood has occasionally targeted conservative moviegoers releasing faith-based movies or patriotic blockbusters such as American Sniper. The difference is that Mr. Sonnier is betting a whole company on a strategy of finding consumers he says are outside the coasts because Texas isn't on the coast, I guess. Marrying ideology with opportunism. That's... Quote, it's funny that in this moment in time, the movies we're making are almost counterculture. Yeah, because when you do something and most of the rest of the world is like, what the fuck is wrong with these people? That does make you counterculture. Just like being pro-sexual harassment is being 
counterculture too. He insists that the film can have a positive role to play in a national conversation. That's of keen personal interest to him. Quote, I hate that this is the state of affairs for our kids. It's fucking miserable and I want to fix it. I'm not a politician, so I can't change the laws, but I can change some hearts and minds through movies, through our art. What, you think I'm a child? Everything. And I don't believe that you cannot be entertained and watch a movie like this. Who in this world would you most like to know that today could be the day that you die? I gotta go, Mom. I love you. I love you too. We were making something I knew was gonna be a good movie and entertaining, but also something that felt really important. Everyone laughed at me naked! So did you feel your hearts and minds being changed into like, yeah, you know what? Dads should be sniping into schools. That's, is it an anti-gun movie? Is that, it's too easy for the kids to get the guns and then do this shit. Let's dig a little deeper. What does Dallas think about guns? Well, his parents divorced a long time ago. His mother remarried, was living in Fredericksburg, Texas. She decided to leave her second husband. Her second husband finding this out, shot and killed her and then killed himself. Two years later, 2012, his father shot and killed in a love triangle jealousy situation. Both of his parents in separate domestic violence, love triangle, jealousy, breakup situations killed. So you think, okay, maybe this dude is like, um, maybe too many guns. People who buy guns for protection, they're like, yep, I'm gonna protect my house, protect my wife. And then his wife leaves and he's like, well, I'm gonna shoot her if she tries to leave. Okay, great stuff. So is that the message of the movie? Too many guns? I don't think so, because it offers up the just stupidest, most unrealistic form of like a good guy with a gun, which is dad fucking sniping into the school. It makes fun of the security guard who's unarmed. They make a point of like, well, he's a security guard, but he doesn't have a gun and then he pisses himself and runs away. So it's like, okay, I think it's saying arm the security guard. What saves the day is Zoe fighting back and Zoe, you know, knows how to hunt, knows how to use guns. So I think it's saying, a good guy with a gun is the way to stop these things and teach your kids to hunt, teach your kids how to use guns, and maybe we arm the students or arm the teachers. But what did the film's distributor have to say about the film? Quote, this film wasn't pro-gun control. No, oh, all right. When I asked about gun laws in the wake of his parents' deaths and mass shootings, Dallas took a moderate stance. Quote, I want to protect my home, he says, and I want people to be able to hunt. I also think it's absurd that we have high capacity magazines. I think it's ridiculous we have weapons of war. I want to do whatever it takes to keep my family safe and provide for my family. Outside of that, I think everything is up for grabs. And of course, once you start talking about like, oh, high capacity magazines are like military grade, the gun nuts will come back at you nitpicking everything about like, well, that's a cartridge, not a bullet. And that's a, that's a clip, not a magazine. It'd be like, if we're trying to talk about drunk driving and car mechanics are like, yeah, but you, that's a straight six, not a V6. So Dallas is pro hunting, we know that, but just not 30 round magazines, all right. And Zoe, just about all we know about her is she knows how to hunt. So if we teach kids to hunt, They'll be badasses and we'll stop school shootings and not panic under pressure. Except if you think back, when she first shoots a deer, she's first learning to hunt. She's already a no panic sociopath who smashes the deer's brains out all over the place, right? So she's not a badass because she learned to hunt. She was already a badass. So what makes her a badass? She is closed off because her mom died of cancer. And dad even said, this is like the very beginning of the movie, dad's like, that look in your eyes. Guys in my unit had that look. Not everything is about the war. You're cutting yourself off. So I think the movie is saying, if we give more moms breast cancer, we will harden our youth to not panic under pressure and we'll be able to stop the school shootings. So think about that one, moms. Uh, this is just a little breast cancer awareness. Be aware, if you cancer up your boobies, you'll save lives, okay? The script was passed around Hollywood, but writer-director Kyle Rankin admits that after Parkland, it had become radioactive. Everyone I talked to for this piece confessed to initial trepidation about the project, which scared them and still seems to scare them despite their firm belief that it can play a positive role in the conversation. 
So this movie's role in the conversation. Cops are incompetent. They're slow to get there and they won't rush in. Sniper dad save the day. So maybe we make a parents militia. Get ready to go snipe all the schools. Uh, more dead moms, harden the kids, right? How about train all the kids with gun, guns, gun safety. And then we have like breaking case of emergency guns in every classroom. You know, like when they hit the lockdown button in the main office, it opens up and there's a gun pops up and every class has their own dedicated best shot of the class. That way, when we go into lockdown, we go into lock and load. It calls to mind the way the right wing thinks about sex ed, which is tell them to never have sex. Because if the kids learn how to use their penises, then they're gonna be sinners. You'll get pregnant and you'll die. Condoms always break, send you to hell. And then like birth control pills, those don't work either. They cause breast cancer, if you ask Conservapedia. So birth control pills cause breast cancer, but breast cancer hardens our youth and then they are better at stopping school shooters. So birth control, maybe it's got its pros and cons. So the right wing, when they're talking about sex ed, it's don't, you know, don't do it. Just never do it. Don't, we don't need, you don't need to know how to do it safely. Just never do it. But then when it comes to guns, they're like, why don't we teach kindergartners gun safety? Teach your kids guns, teach your kids how to hunt. Today, we're going to teach you how you can stop these naughty men and have them take a long nap. Philip, will you show us auto feed puppy pistol his lunch box and push it into his tummy like this because no kid who learns the safety from a responsible parent will then go hunt their fucking classmates that'll never happen jesus fucking christ doesn't matter if you're teaching them safe sex or open communication or you know how to use a holster how to make sure the safety's on boys you know what i'm saying no 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 never sex no sex sex is bad never sex but guns, hey, you know, the more information, the better. Let's teach these fucking kindergartners. Those teenage boys will never take their new knowledge. Hunt milfs or something. I'm mixing my metaphors pretty strongly now. You want me to say on television that I support three and four year olds with firearms? You can do Typically of members of Congress don't just hear a story about a program and then indicate whether they support it or not. I support the kindergartens program. We in America would be wise to implement it too. A three year old cannot defend itself from a assault rifle by throwing a Hello Kitty pencil case at it. Our founding fathers did not put an age limit on the Second Amendment. The way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good kid with a gun. A good kid with a gun. A good child with a gun. I also learned from this film that lockdowns are bad. Lockdowns are super bad. We need a, we need a national conversation about how lockdowns are dumb. The lockdown procedures, the idiocy of the reactions. And instead what you should do is you should run, right? Because you're sitting duck to become a hostage. Really, if there's a shooter, you should just run, right? So what crap are we teaching the kids and the teachers right now that we need to have a conversation about? Well, um, it's called run, hide, fight. So the first step is if you can, you run. Um, wh you guys are acting like no one is aware that running should be option one. This is what we train. I'm trained on this shit. Run, hide, fight. We try to run first. This has been the standard thing for years now. It'd be like if you're making a movie now about like the dangers of asbestos. Like, yeah, yeah, we know. Oh, and by the way, uh, the 1998 Arkansas school shooting, the kids uh, pulled the fire alarm and then sniped their classmates and teachers when they ran outside the school. So maybe just run isn't really that great. Maybe locking down is good sometimes. The Parkland shooter pulled the fire alarm so that everyone was like in the hallways instead of like being locked down and like hidden. So what are you saying? Like we need to ignore fire alarms? It's like you need perfect situational awareness. Don't run if they're sniping. If they're in the cafeteria, okay, run. If there's a fire alarm, you should just stay put. Oh, uh, whoops, then there's a fire and like 400 people die because they didn't leave. Like, what are you trying to fucking say? Like, there's not good answers to this shit, except for the big one, which is that there's too many guns. That's not what we're, no, nah, that's not, that can't be. When they drill, like, here's what we do if there's a shooter, and then we train all the students what to do, and like, then one of those students becomes a shooter, and they know what the plan is. So they know everyone's locked down, and where they're locked down, and like, how it works. So I guess it's saying, don't drill, don't do drills. You're just training the, the mass shooter, when experts look back on this day, they will agree that she should have announced lockdown over the intercom immediately. The new rule states that she must first confirm the information. How do I know this? Because they publicly vote on this shit at the school board meeting. 
turns out you you have to drill it. I've been in law enforcement for more than three decades, and I'm a nationally recognized expert on school safety. You have to have a plan, you have to be prepared, and you have to practice. If you don't, you're never going to be able to implement your plan. Now I've seen several people on the internet give this film a lot of credit for predicting the Uvalde cops not going in, the cops being fucking cowards and just like waiting around. They didn't predict this. This shit's happened repeatedly. Since Columbine, there's been a bunch of incidents where the cops have been like really slow to react or they're waiting for SWAT when it's like, no, you need to just go in. Like there's been a number of these. Uvalde was just like the most extreme example. So they didn't predict anything. They were, this is just another one of the things they threw in the hopper that's like really happened. And it just shows like you can have all the training, you can have body armor and guns and superiority in numbers and communication and radios and still not have the guts to go in there. But apparently just any good Samaritan with a pistol will do that. If only all the cops in Uvalde had had their dad teach them how to smash deer brains out with a rock, they would have had the guts to go in. Or if their moms died of breast cancer, maybe? This is a right to let an animal suffer for <laughs> That's the thing, everyone thinks I would be the big hero. If you know, I was at a robbery and I was concealed carrying, oh yeah, I'd be the John McClane, I would do that. Oh, if somebody breaks into my house, I got a gun, I'm gonna pff, wipe them out. I would be great at that. And almost all of you are completely wrong. Not all of you, almost all of you are wrong. You just can't know it until it happens. If you don't have any doubts, if you think, oh, for sure I'd be great at this, your imagination is failing you, like horribly. Meanwhile, you put someone on the spot on sports radio and suddenly they like freeze up and don't know, oh, who won the Heisman? Uh, was it uh, George Brett? Fucking Tim. God damn, I heard that, Tim. So we go now from Run, Hide, Fight, uh, which Matt Walsh called great escapism, which, Matt, if this film is escapism, what are you normally doing? Holy shit. You call me faggot when I see you in the halls. It's kind of our, our thing. Who's the fact now, man? <laughs> From the escapism of this fun film, we go behind the scenes at Cinestate, the Texas indie film company. Sonny A, by the way, that's like the least Texan name I've ever heard. It'd be like if you found out that some French Canadian fashion designer was named Colt McDodge. At Cinestate, you got Dallas Sonnier, big shot, and then there's two producers, Adam Donaghy and Amanda Presmick. Donaghy was known to be a creepy pervert for years. Over 30 people confirmed that Donaghy's sexual harassment and labor violations were common knowledge in the Texas film scene. A theater banned him for being creepy, twice. There's stories about him getting female employees alone, like, don't pick, you gotta pick me up at my house, and then he's like answering the door in just a bathrobe. A young woman who worked for him, Kristen Haynes, uh, this is in 2014, he was harassing her a bunch so much that she starts recording the audio and he's like, show me your underwear. This audio, you can listen to it. So she would start telling people immediately, would play the audio for people. There was a big rap party for a film in 2016. She's showing it to a bunch of producers. Quote, it became really common knowledge with filmmakers sharing the audio with one another. People would say, let me play this for you before hiring this person. Over a dozen people in the Dallas film scene, from filmmakers to producers to crew, told the Daily Beast that two people who turned a blind eye to it were Cinestate founder Dallas Sonnier and his producing partner Amanda Presmick. Uh, meanwhile, Fred Williamson is an actor. He groped a costume designer and then tried to laugh it off. Uh, and then a woman in hair and makeup quit like right after that, after quote, a barrage of sexual overtures. Right, so this old dude actor is sexually harassing multiple women on set. So what did the producers do? Four crew members say Sonnier and Presmick held an onset meeting with the crew where they explained they couldn't replace him and that women on set should use a buddy system when dealing with him. Yeah, we know he's like sexually harassing you. Just like use a buddy system and you won't get raped. That's a great fucking plan. Here's a fun quote. The first time I was ever on set, I was warned about Adam Donaghy, one female filmmaker told the Daily Beast. I was told he was the Harvey Weinstein of Dallas. So when shit hits the fan and that shit starts going public, Dallas pointed out that he didn't live in Dallas and that he was very busy running his company. This is why he didn't know. I didn't know about this. Uh, even though it was widely circulated in the Texas film world, uh, like everybody fucking knew about it. He also criticized Haynes for not filing an 
official sexual harassment complaint and repeatedly characterized the allegations against him and his studio as performative and partisan. We're under siege right now, says Sonia. Everyone involved has their own personal vendettas against us. They have a history of harassing us and having problems with us. It feels like a targeted hit. It feels like an attack. I think people have real issues with us. They have issues with our success, with the amount of movies we've made, and in a short time built this company to be something very special, it feels very partisan. See, uh, when you're a Republican or a Libertarian, uh, the Me Too movement will expose you for being a piece of shit, and then that's partisan. So, maybe he's right. Maybe all the accusers are just jealous of his super cool film company, right? Partisan, performative, radical feminists trying to cancel him. Everybody watching is culpable. You all post and you tweet and you share. Everybody jumps at the chance to be both judge and jury, but in that system, sure, you created an executioner. You created me. Because he makes conservative movies. Maybe that's what's going on. The Ringer did an article on Sin State in Dallas and it was called, Does the Movie Industry Need an Unsafe Space? In April of 2020, Adam Donaghy, well-known piece of shit, was arrested for sexual assault of a minor. Multiple articles are written, exposés, all these quotes start coming out, all these suddenly we're gonna report, you know, 30 people are like, yeah, everyone knew he was a piece of shit. Yep, Dallas knew, he ignored it. Yep, here's one example of something happening on their sets. Quote, a female star had to perform sex scenes with a friend of one of the movie producers who was just subbed into the shoot at the last minute. Yeah, not the actor you thought you were working with. Eh, I'm going to just throw my friend in there here, have sex with him. So, hey, Ringer, maybe don't celebrate an unsafe space. Maybe not a great idea. To be fair to the Ringer, they meant unsafe in the like triggering the libs kind of way, not in the rape kind of way. Uh, but that article came out six months before the rape arrest. So it's not a great look. If you ask me, repeatedly ignoring rapey piece of shit behavior, uh, repeatedly putting that person into positions of power over young women, repeatedly not giving a shit when people complain directly to you and be like, why don't you just use a buddy system? You'll get raped that way. And then it becomes public and you get bad press and then you fire that guy. That seems performative to me. I don't think you cared about the rapey behavior. I think you're just performing and acting like you care because it made you look bad. So I, he fires him and is like, oh my God, we're gonna fix everything. Quote, we're going to make our sets the safest sets in the universe, right? We're gonna fix this. But then is like, I mean, but I didn't hear any of these complaints. Nobody told me about it. And like, I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. And so like, well, it's not my fault. Oh, and also woke people are trying to get us and attack us. He couldn't even do the performative part, right? He's not even a good actor. So back to Run, Hide, Fight, God damn it. It's filmed in 2019, not yet released when the rape uh, arrest happens. And now suddenly their distribution falls through. Set in a high school, filled with extras portraying high school girls. And who's working on the film? Uh, Adam Donaghy, rapist. He uh, alleged, accused, rapist. He uh, was producing the film. You won't find his name in the credits. They took his name out of the credits. So you thought this film was in poor taste because of the school shooting stuff. Turns out uh, it's the it's rapey too. Okay. Quote, there were hundreds of minors on that set who were all extras. And I don't think the crew was big enough to have eyes on all of them. And that is a very creepy thing for me to think about. So he's arrested. Cinestate is pretty well fucked. Like the studio fucking closed down and like, I don't know if it completely closed and then they opened a new one or if they just like are rebranding it. But now Dallas is running something called Bonfire Legend, who you may have heard of because they're the one company that would touch Gina Carano after she became openly anti-Semitic, among other things. So they're working with her now. But they've got Run, Hide, Fight in the can and their distribution fell through. This film that Hollywood didn't want to touch when it was just about school shootings. Now it's associated with rape and you had a rapist alleged rapist running around your set around a bunch of underage or young women. Fucking great. Uh, who the fuck's gonna distribute this film? What fucking moron is gonna be like, yeah, let's work with this guy. Let's really put this movie out there. What fucking Muppet would be not just stupid enough to sign up to work with them, but would be like really proud of it. Be like, yeah, let's bring this guy in and like, make a big deal out of it. We're gonna, we're gonna be partners now. Surely nobody is this fucking stupid. Surely you can't find someone that dumb. Cut, dick. Well, so we are about to embark on a 
an excellent journey together. Well, we are, of course, super excited to be releasing it with you over at Daily Wire. This is the first feature film released by The Daily Wire. It is considered by The Daily Wire to be their official launch into the entertainment industry. So the hunt for the worst streaming service may be at its end. We may have found it. The Daily Wire. Suck it, passion flicks. Suck it gently. See previous video. So that's the only people that would work with Dallas anymore. Uh, the very principled people over at The Daily Wire. If you don't know The Daily Wire, uh, you know conservative talk radio, like Rush Limbaugh stuff? Picture that, but it's like on the internet now. Occasionally they hire a comedian, or they try to hire a comedian and it goes hilariously wrong. It's Rush Limbaugh, but on the internet, basically. Here is some of their conservative principles for you. Me Too's gone too far. Okay, good principle right there. But our friends over at Hershey's, they don't even know what a woman is. They've hired a biological male to be the spokesperson for their Women's Day campaign. And they're calling that campaign, and I swear I'm not making this up, her, she. Her, she. And it's the reason that I'm launching she, her, and he, him. One of them's got nuts. If you need me to tell you which one it is, Keep giving your money to Hershey's. So now that they're fully partners and the libertarian leading Dallas, who's not a Republican, what's he making now? Like libertarian films? He Well, he produced a film for The Daily Wire starring Matt Walsh called What is a Woman? An anti-trans film. You know, what is a woman? I don't know what a woman is. It's I'm just, I'm just gonna ask common sense question. How do you know what a woman is? What, is that a woman? How do you define it? And it's all just anti-trans stuff. Just as an aside. Kleinfelter syndrome, that's all I have to say. Uh, Matt Walsh says trans women aren't allowed because uh, he can't do blackface, so that's only fair. So this guy, common sense, Matt Walsh, he says he wants to protect the children, but then gets real creepy about like age of consent and like, what's the right age to impregnate girl, teen girls? Is, uh, eh. That's why- That's why they're that's, still alive. Yeah, that's why you can have someone in their 70s who's celebrating their you know, uh, 55th wedding anniversary because they got married when they were teenagers. So what I'm saying is that the problem is not per se teenage pregnancy, it's unwed pregnancy. That's the problem. And this is me just stating, I'm, I'm just, right now I'm gonna start by just stating facts. Uh, fact three, girls between the ages of like 17 and 24 is when they're technically most fertile. Yeah. Okay? That's biological. That's a fact, all right? I'm just stating facts, that's all I'm doing. That there's a lot of bad sex, there's a lot of immoral sex, there's a lot of disordered, gross, harmful sex that is nonetheless consensual. The word consent has, has become to, is, is, is increasingly means nothing because we've expanded it so much. Oh, it's something willingly and it's like, yes, let's do this. And But even that might not be consent because we've turned consent into this super confusing. He uh, would rather be dead than have a trans kid. Just, I'm just stating facts, right? He's just like, I'm just stating facts. Uh, Matt Walsh, by the way, stated some facts. He said a black mermaid for the new Little Mermaid is not, quote, scientifically sound. No. He also said anime is satanic. All of anime, satanic. What is a woman? I give speeches, I write books. I like to make sense of things. I like scented candles and I've watched Sex and the City. Yeah. How do I know if, if I'm a woman? That's a great like, question. You're not a scientist, you're not a gender studies major. No. How do you know that you're a man? I guess because I got a dick. He's an idiot about climate change, vaccines. He compared Ashley Babbitt, the January 6th insurrectionist that was shot while storming the Capitol, trying to like fucking murder Congress people. He compared her getting shot to cops shooting unarmed black men by the like hundreds. He defended Andrew Jackson for the whole genocide thing. He's also on the side of the Canadian church schools with their mass graves of native children. He's on the church's side with that that one. And he said Joe Biden is a Marxist extremist. Oh, he's so, oh my God, he's so not a Marxist, oh my God. He like shut down a, the rail workers trying to unionize, go on strike or whatever. You think that's a Marxist? You fucking idiot. I like to make sense of things. So anyway, that's who Dallas is working with now. All right, let's talk Ben Shapiro. He's the founder of the Daily Wire, right? He's in charge of this. He's now a proud distributor of Cinestate Bonfire Legends films. If you don't know Ben Shapiro, he's the conservative idea of an intellectual. He, he sounds like a smart guy, a real genius, a real master debater. And here's what a conservative intellectual spends his time doing. Things like, you know, you make this face, you go, liberals. Feminist 
TikToks are stupid. Why aren't M&M's sexy anymore? Hunter to Biden's dick pics. The Grammys are satanic. And he has a mug on his desk that says leftist tears, which you can get if you sign up for the Daily Wire's streaming service. This is the conservative intellectual, folks. He's about as elite intelligentsia as you're getting on the right anymore. I mean, they send people with GEDs to Congress to talk about Jewish space lasers. So this is as good as it gets. He writes very serious books. He wrote a serious book called The Right Side of History, How Reason and Moral Purpose Made the West Great. He wrote a book called Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings. Oh, facts don't care about your feelings. Feelings. He's all about fat. He's a facts guy. Ben Shapiro grew up in LA. Both of his parents worked in Hollywood. Uh, the girl that played Matilda, that's his cousin. He wanted to be a screenwriter. He wrote a dramedy pilot set at Harvard Law. He was trying to get an agent. And then according to him and nobody else, he got a phone call from top men. And they were like, hey, by the way, you've been blacklisted from Hollywood. Because that happened. That's a thing. And then that person he claims said that turns out they're like dead already and they can't confirm or deny i just love he gets a phone call hey ben this is hollywood you've been blacklisted baby okay so he immediately writes a book called primetime propaganda how the left took over hollywood to brainwash you or something like that now i can't say for sure what his script is about but when ben shapiro went to college and realized that college isn't just another like fox news conservative talk radio echo chamber and then like the teachers were telling him like other stuff he promptly wrote a book called Brainwashed, How Universities Indoctrinate America's Youth. So he must have like really gotten interested in this and then spent like a decade doing like research and learning about like the history of the university and higher ed and interviewing like dozens of experts. Oh, just kidding. He wrote it when he was 19. 19 years old, he wrote a book, Brainwashed, How Universities Indoctrinate America's Youth. And the right was, oh, so willing to just publish that shit immediately. From chapter one, look at this level of expertise he's developed. I know all of this, not because of polling data or talk radio, which is often far more reliable and accurate than network news, but from personal experience. I have taken dozens of courses throughout my UCLA career. Talk radio, talk radio, talk, talk radio. He grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh. And then he gets to college and the professors say shit that's not the same as what Rush Limbaugh said. So those professors must be trying to brainwash him. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go write a book about this. And if you think, hey, well, maybe Ben Shapiro, conservative genius, maybe he was listening to some very high-minded talk radio. Maybe it wasn't Rush Limbaugh, you know, it's some, probably some smarty you've never heard of. Oh, uh, just kidding. Uh, Rush Limbaugh's brother wrote the foreword on his book. Okay. Man brainwashed by talk radio thinks college professors are trying to brainwash him, writes book called Brainwashed. This is the Ben Shapiro story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write a biopic. There's the title. Are we still in lockdown? Good Lord. Just, can they like fucking kill themselves already? Like, ugh. Ben tells a story on page 73. He was giving a presentation on drilling in Alaska. Let's all guess, where did Ben Shapiro in, in like 2004, where did he stand on drilling the Alaskan wildlife refuge or whatever? Oh, look at that. We all knew exactly whatever the conservative talking point was on conservative talk radio. We already know what he was gonna say. Like, what a genius. A fellow student asked, quote, why can't we get rid of cars and like all ride bicycles and stuff? Quote, I was stunned. This was a first grade question coming out of the mouth of a college student at a highly respected university. Bicycles aren't going to cut it. If the Chinese were to attack us with tanks, could we fight them with bicycles? Ben, are you planning on fighting tanks with your car? On page 54, Ben Shapiro wrote, quote, sex is promoted nonstop in the classroom. Pedophilia is acceptable, if a bit weird. Statutory rape is laughed off. Bestiality is fine. Yep, that's what's in the syllabus, Ben. Just read the syllabus. Day one, introductions. Day two, bestiality is fine. Day three, pedophilia, acceptable. But is it a bit weird? A class discussion. Day five, statutory rape. It's funny, but why is it funny? So I'm guessing he wrote his dramedy screenplay about Harvard Law. I'm the kind of jerk who would, who'd go to a party at Harvard <laughs> Law and we'd go, we'd go to a party and I would bring a book with me because if people were boring, I was not going to waste the two hours just, just sitting there. It's a good time there. to read right now. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I got in a lot of good reading at these parties. So wow. like, it's very difficult to get me to go out to dinner, even with people who are prominent, because I don't want to. Like, it, you have to make the case as to why I should be spending the time yeah. with you. And how nobody liked him. I mean, about how it's nothing but affirmative action and woke feminists. And it was like really funny. 
and the only reason it wasn't immediately made into a hilarious TV show is Hollywood's bias against conservatives. And like, maybe he didn't include enough like statutory rape jokes because that's so laughable. You know, he's too moral to have statutory rape jokes maybe. By the way, he was recently made fun of a lot because he criticized the murder mystery film, Glass Onion. He said the writing of it was stupid and bad because quote, the first half of the movie is a complete misdirect and a waste of time. Just wait till he reads Ag Agatha Christie, Agatha. I wonder what he was thinking about when he took his English classes. Quote, if your child majors in English, you're sponsoring the militant homosexual agenda. This is a man who now owns a streaming service, apparently. He is very upset by WAP and like read the lyrics on air, like he's William Shatner or something. And the, he's, his point is that if it's that wet, there's something wrong with her. And so now everyone's like, you know, pussies get wet, right, Ben? He really walked into this one. Swipe your nose like a credit card. Hop on top, I want to ride. I do a Kegel while it's inside. This, this is what feminists fought for. It frankly sounds like somebody describing what amounts to a serious condition that requires the care of a doctor. Not to be too graphic, but some sort of a medical discharge that's happening here. I love his stance on climate change, which is that like, well, you know, when the sea level rises, you just sell your beach house. Let's say for the sake of argument, that all of the water levels around the world rise by, by, let's say, five feet. You think that people aren't going to just sell their homes and move? Just one small problem. Sell their houses to who, Ben? Fucking Aquaman! He really does not seem to like black people or trans ple people or Muslims. Oh, and is uh, still mad that uh, they removed homosexuality from the list of mental disorders in the DSM in the 70s, by the way. There was no actual scientific reason to do so. Homosexual men have higher rates of suicide and depression than heterosexuals. Homosexuals are statistically deviant and homosexuals are definitionally incapable of reproduction. But due to pressure group influence, homosexuality was out. Spit in my mouth, look in my eyes. So Shapiro, always going on about liberal propaganda, Hollywood liberals, the elite coastal, propaganda. They're crying, trying to brainwash your kids. They're always trying to cram in a message about how being a gay is okay. Trans is okay. Women deciding to be child free. That's Satan. Uh, Hollywood sucks because they're not trying to tell good stories. They're trying to brainwash you because according to him, good stories by their nature are conservative. When you look at the structure of story, Story is inherently bent toward conservatism. Why? Because it has to contrast virtue with non-virtue. In order to have heroes, you have to have villains. In order to have heroes and villains, you have to have values. So the idea of a moral relativism in which there is no right and there is no wrong, and we have to understand every side of the story, every movie that you see that has a hero overcoming obstacles, okay, these are all conservative values. They do not hold up to, to left-wing scrutiny. In fact, even the most left-wing films you've seen are built along these lines. I do a Kegel while it's inside. And that's why no one likes movies anymore. I don't know if you noticed this, but no one likes movies anymore uh, because they're all liberal propaganda. And so now he would like to make his conservative propaganda. It's amazing. In one breath, these people will be like, it's so bad. They're just trying to brainwash you with propaganda and cram a message down your throat. So anyway, we're gonna make our own propaganda now. Ben, Dallas, if the problem with Hollywood is that they're too busy trying to brainwash you and they don't just tell good stories anymore. All you have to do is just tell good stories that aren't brainwashy and then you'll make shit loads of money because you're just telling good stories. And yet we're trying to pander to Trump voters. Ben Shapiro, ready? Here's a quote. We picked up this movie after Hollywood turned it down because it didn't include leftist talking points. Ben, nobody wanted to distribute it because of the rape thing. It was the rape thing. Oh, oh, I get it. See, Ben Shapiro is confused because he thought sexual assault of a minor, that's just like laughable statutory rape. He thought that was like a fun anecdote about the film set. In Cinestate, it ended with uh, some some real conflagration at your company. Uh, maybe yeah. you can talk about that and lay that out for folks who sure. missed it. We, we talk a lot in, in the conservative entertainment industry about uh, unity and we talk about, uh, you know, is art political? Do movies become political? So Cinestate made movies across the board, sort of less woke, more based movies out, outside of the Cinestate label. No one wanted to get along. They didn't want to be associated with the other side. They didn't want to find a shared common ground and resources. Hollywood didn't like it because 
Quote, it celebrated heroic bravery instead of glorifying mass shooters. Yes, Hollywood would have loved it if it glorified mass shooters, but it, it didn't glorify the mass shooter by letting him be like Hans Gruber and um, give speeches and be really competent. Uh, two other school shooting films leap to mind when I think about school shootings. Gus Van Sant's Elephant and Denis Villeneuve's Polytechnique. And both of those films do not glorify school shootings or the violence involved. You, you watch those, you do not come away going, oh, that was cool blood splatter on the wall. Look at the way the body went flying. Or if you show, put, point the gun at a girl, you get to see her titties, you know. Truffaut said, it's hard to make an anti-war film because war is exciting, even if you're against it. So like, you have to be really careful that you don't accidentally glorify it. And this movie's going like, well, well past that point. Roger Ebert gave Elephant four out of four stars saying, it's a violent movie in the sense that many innocent people are shot dead, but it isn't violent in the way it presents those deaths. There's no pumped up style, no lingering, no release, no climax. With some wet ass P word, P word is female genitalia. Just implacable, poker faced, flat, uninflected death. I doubt Elephant will ever inspire anyone to copy what they see on screen. Villeneuve's Polytechnique is similar, uh, has something to say. It's basically about like insults hating women. Spoilers, one of the main characters is a man who survives the shooting. And then the end of the movie is after, well, after the shooting, him committing suicide because he has like survivor's guilt. Thanks for saving my life. You gave mine a purpose. 18 years ago. This is like the best thing that's ever happened to her. She gets over her, the death of her mom. She opens out of her shell. She gets a boyfriend. She reconnects with like her dad a little bit, it becomes a hero. All this, this is like the best day of her life. The Daily Wire makes a big deal about being the first media, whatever the fuck they think they are, to declare that they would never mention the name of any of these mass shooters. Like we're not gonna glorify any mass shooters. No media recognition. And then they distribute this film. This is the first film they've distributed. Maybe their policy of not naming mass shooters is because there's a bunch, oh, damn it. There's a bunch of mass shooters who turned out, oh, looks like they're following Ben Shapiro on Twitter and they're obsessed with Trump and they're here they are seen at a MAGA rally. And maybe, well, let's not name them. Let's not talk about what they follow and who they're, who maybe inspired them. Run, Hide, Fight has really low critic score and really high audience score. And this is evidence, this is proof. The critics are these elitists. And they don't get it. The real people watch it go, this is a really good movie. The critics are st stupid elitists who are mad that it's not leftist talking points. Uh, guys, who's the audience that's actually watched this movie? It's on the fucking Daily Wire's streaming service. You didn't even know that existed. Who the fuck's even heard of this movie except for people who follow the Daily Wire? You, you watched it because Ben Shapiro told you to. Oh, shocking. The conservatives on this tiny streaming platform really like this movie the conservatives made. And you see all this stuff like Ben Shapiro will say and like Daily Wire, and they'll say like, this movie is blacklisted by Hollywood. Hollywood doesn't want you to see it because it's not woke liberal propaganda. It's like, no, it wasn't distributed because of the rape thing. Here's from some uh, reviews. Hollywood expects very little from its audience except to push a political agenda. No political agenda here. And there are no typical Hollywood high school caricatures. Hollywood copy paste plot twists or Hollywood standards of wokeness. Art for art's sake. Trigger warning. Any criticism of the quality of this movie is completely disingenuous. These elitist reviewers need to learn to at least give credit where credit's due or they'll never be taken seriously. Movie was phenomenal overall. There was a couple of awkward moments in forced dialogue, but that, with any action thriller, they're not meant to be literary in nature. However, the conservative values were evident. It's not propagandist like leftist entertainment is. I love this. Any criticism of this movie is completely disingenuous. It had awkward moments in forced dialogue though. Oh, okay. You hear voices too. See, they love it because it's conservative propaganda, or they love it because it's got no political agenda. They literally only care about it because it's in this like culture war. Usually there's unnecessary and vulgar content. Reach out and grab me by the neck. Films these days. Whether it comes in the form of graphic sex. Everyone laughed at me naked. Horrendous violence and gore for the sake of just that. 
One of the better movies in recent years. Of course the woke critics won't be happy with it, because the girl is a father figure to look up to. Widely hated by idiot woke critics for grown adults. This is a solid thriller, and a great example of girl power, without all the ignorance of modern, preachy delusion, Captain Marvel, with a heroine who is a human and vulnerable, while demonstrating remarkable strength and courage. It's obvious why audiences love it, and elitist leftist critics hate it. When the movie industry is filled with woke culture, it's refreshing to see a movie from conservatives. It has that one thing that liberals hate, a, a father figure. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. If you look at Amazon, all the one-star reviews are clearly from woke liberals who are fighting back in the culture war. Just kidding. It's uh, conservatives who are giving it one star because they bought the German Blu-ray and it won't play on their DVD player. <laughs> oh, that's great. And I swear I'm not making this up. This is the second time this has happened. Can't you put on a warning label? I hate so much that I'm giving this movie one star because I think if I had gotten to actually watch it, it would have been really good. Man, suffer for <laughs> Others have had the same problem of saying wrong region when they put the DVD in their player and that is exactly what mine said. These people don't seem to understand or know that like region coding exists. Like that it's never occurred to them that like not everything in the world's made specifically for America. And then they're like, what the, f what is this? This is un-American. They need warning labels. So why are the elites always trying to cram a liberal woke message down your throat? But then as soon as they think there's conservative propaganda, they're like five stars, my team's doing it. We're gonna throw, this is good throat jamming stuff from my team. Like bro, I could give two shits if a movie's woke. Like, that's my score system, by the way. It goes from three shits to eight shits. So the lowest score I can give it is three shits, because I couldn't give two shits, which is off scale low. If I wanted to give it two shits, I can't, I can't even, couldn't even give two shits. And if a great movie, you know, makes you go eight shit. I would never go around giving five star reviews to movies because it had woke shit in it. For one thing, I don't really go around leaving reviews on anything anyway, because, you know, democracy doesn't work and you can you can go give this german blu-ray all the one-star reviews you want and these idiots are going to keep buying it and trying to cram the german blu-ray into their vcrs this is <sighs> and a culture war now leads to a political war later and it is coming for you the cavalier executives in hollywood hate you they are hell-bent on pushing their narrative and destroying anything that doesn't totally serve their agenda. You have to fight back. So what do you do if you're, if you're, if you're just a, a, a person who loves movies and loves freedom of speech and loves America? Well, a few things. You support the companies that support us, right? Give me money. Money me. Money now. Me a money needing a lot now. Swipe your nose like a credit card. P.S. Hollywood is not trying to brainwash you. Their goal is not to brainwash. They want to make money. They're trying to make money. They want to make money because it's run by, according to Gina Carano. Okay, no, 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 back it up. I think Ben Shapiro would say it's run by bad Jews. They want to make money. And if they get canceled or lots of bad press because they employ a rapist, that's bad for business. Sometimes they do performative shit like Disney putting a 1.5 second lesbian kiss into Star Wars just to be like, see, look how we're, like we were a little woke. And I criticize them for that because then they cut it out when they release it in other parts of the world. And it's like, this, this is performative and dumb. They're just trying to make money though. That's it. They're not gender swapping Ghostbusters to prop up feminism. They're just trying to make money. They're out of ideas. And there might be individual people, like maybe a gay person who's like, how come every gay character is like a serial killer or insane or a horrible stereotype? Maybe I want some like positive representation of that. That doesn't mean they're like, okay, everyone in Hollywood, let's, let's force gay content on everyone's throats. Just like Ben Shapiro, uh, who wants to write a screenplay about being a virgin conservative Jew at Harvard Law and show that his character has depth and is not just a joke stereotype. Just as an aside about Ben Shapiro, I love this. He recently came up with a formula for the legitimacy of a government and he's such an idiot. Oh my God. So S plus, and then it's R times A plus I. Okay, so S in this particular equation represents social solidarity. The denominator, the bottom line, those terms are all multiplied together, which means if any of those terms is zero, the whole bottom becomes zero. 
And what happens if you divide something by zero? You get infinity. V is violation of fundamental or pragmatic rights by the authority. R, right? This is R prime. It's the regulatory strictness of the authority. So the authority passes very, very strong regulations. And finally, the aggressiveness of the enforcement by the authority. Just think about this. A government that violates the rights as much as you can imagine, the most rights violating government imaginable. If they have zero regulations, this whole term becomes zero and now we have an infinitely legitimate government. Or a government collapses and now it has zero authority over anything, it can't enforce any other regulations. The bottom goes to zero, it's infinitely legitimate. As long as you have something on the top line, infinitely legitimate. So the best government in the world is if you can find like two people who will agree that they live in the Byzantine Empire because that's social solidarity. We get something on the top. That government doesn't exist though. It has absolutely no power. So it's a zero on the bottom. Infinitely legitimate government. The best possible government is the Byzantine Empire right now. Intellectual Ben Shapiro. I said certified freak seven days a week. Wet ass P word. Make that pullout game weak. Let's get back to the meaning of the film, the political agenda. I'm a teacher. I've been a professor for like seven years at two universities. I was a grad assistant for three more years. I was a substitute teacher for, I don't know, like five years, uh, three different school districts. So I have been trained many a time. Subbing is interesting because you walk into like a new school every day. They give you a binder and it's like, all right, here's what to do if, they're, if we do a fire alarm. And here's what it means when it says, Mr. Smith is in the lobby. The film presents teachers as just idiot cheap. They're like, this is the protocol. Ask a real teacher, ask a real teacher. What would you do? Because we've fucking thought about it, because we have to. And we know, like, well, here are the improvised weapons. Ask ask a teacher, you know, what's the improvised weapon here? Well, I got this this uh, pool cue in the corner. I've got this uh, aquarium I'm going to smash over somebody's head. Like, fucking, we thought about it. we got all kinds of shit. You know why we have too many school shootings? Because we have too many fucking guns in this country. And you look at all the data, all these stats, more guns, more shootings. It's not hard. There's a lot of countries in the world that are, you know, like us and they don't have this problem because they don't have as many guns. But apparently that uh, we can't solve that problem. There's just no way to solve this. We put men on the moon with 60s technology, but too many guns, we can't figure that problem out. That's too hard to figure out. It seems like the message of the movie would be like, yeah, it's there's too many guns and all these kids get the guns and then they can shoot up their school and you have 21 dead. Like this is the success story of the film. Only 17 dead innocents, we did it. And the right loves this one. They love whenever there's like a mass shooting or someone goes and like opens fire in a church and then there's like one good Samaritan, bam, good guy with a gun ended it. They only killed five people. <laughs> you know what doesn't make headlines? A crazy person wanted to go shoot up a school, couldn't get a gun. We don't see that in the headlines. Crazy guy with delusions of grandeur trying to kill hundreds of people takes a samurai sword on the subway, injures three. You know, that could be one. So like, what do you want to do? You want to arm the teachers? I got a gun right here. I'm a pretty good trigger discipline. Let's imagine a country went out of its way to get just tons of guns. And if this good guy with the gun theory worked, then that country would have like the least mass shooting deaths per capita. Whenever a bad guy tried to do anything, they're getting capped immediately. Or they're just deterred. They're like, well, what's the point? There's so many good guys with guns. But America is that experiment. We are the world capital of good guys with guns. And we're also the world capital of mass shootings. So even more, we don't have enough. We need more guns, that's the answer. Look at this graph. Look at this map. Look at this photograph. You're six times more likely to be killed with a gun in Mississippi than you are in liberal New York. You're seven to eight times more likely to be killed with a gun in Wyoming or Louisiana or Mississippi than in Massachusetts. Now maybe it's because people in Massachusetts are just like really nice. Or maybe it's because there's like shitloads of guns in Wyoming. Oh, it could be that. I like to make sense of things. Here's the real root of the problem. Are you ready? Having a gun makes you feel safer, but you're not, right? There's accidents. You can leave your gun out found by some kids, right? The dog stepped on the trigger, shoot you, that happens. Uh, dad thought there was an intruder, but actually it was just a teenage kid sneaking back in because he went to a drag show when he wasn't supposed to. He's sneaking back in the middle of the night, bam. Or just a traditional pastime, you know? Regular old suicide. Think about that one, people. Gun ownership and suicide are correlated. A man is eight times more likely to kill himself if he owns a gun than if he doesn't own a gun, right? And on the right, you guys will say, if you want to kill yourself, 
you don't need a gun. Which is true, but a gun seems easier. Seems a lot easier. And we're fucking lazy. But do you take all of those into account when you buy a gun? Are you thinking about, well, the accident, let leave it out. Oh, uh, I might do a domestic violence. I might kill myself. I might shoot my gay son when he's sneaking in at night. Nope, you know what you're thinking about? I'm gonna be a big hero. I've never met anyone who says they're unsafe with guns. Everybody you know who owns a gun, you ask, oh, are you safe with a gun? Oh yeah, I'm super safe. Um, I'm so safe with it. Ask them, would you ever do a murder-suicide? They're not, okay. Every fucking gun owner is the most responsible gun owner. There, everyone is. And then fucking the six-year-old shows up to school with a gun. My next door neighbor growing up, uh, I knew this kid from like, when he was in like second grade to like seventh grade, something like that, and he moved. And I lost touch with him high school and college, but I still picture him as like a third grader. When he was 28, he, I think was at a party, discovers maybe a lady cheating, some sort of love triangle situation. And he pulls a gun, kills the dude, the other man. And then it's just like at the party. And I was like, fuck. And he told someone, quote, he went to this woman and said, I have no more future. And then he went into another room and he killed himself. I guarantee you, when he bought that gun, he felt safer. He felt more powerful. He felt good about it. He never in a million years thought, you know, maybe I don't buy a gun because I'll end up doing a murder-suicide. But he did. It just happens. And it happens a lot more than your wet dream fantasy of you being the big hero stopping a mass shooting. I was watching some Ben Shapiro crap for this. And this wasn't even about like arming teachers or anything. And then they did this ad for the mass shooting survival guide. So I read some of it. Uh, here's my favorite section. So why haven't we implemented a program like this already? It's because the anti-gun crowd and the liberal politicians, is there a difference? Should there be? Are you complaining that liberals and liberal politicians are in cahoots? Oh my God. Those liberals want you to believe that a physically fit teacher wearing a level three holster, uh, who's been trained in weapons retention and the use of force is more dangerous to your children than a school shooter who walks through the front door loaded down with multiple firearms and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. So that's not a straw man argument at all. Like, if the option is there is a school shooter walking in the building right now in my school, I'm in a school, do I want a gun or not? I have an option. I'm taking the fucking gun and I would arm the, gun, the teachers too. Yes. But again, you are fixated on the hero moment. There's something like 80 million students in the United States, something like four to five million teachers. So if we're saying arm the teachers, and let's say not all of them, one in 10 teachers do the training, get armed, take a gun to school every day. 500,000 teachers. 500,000 times a day, a teacher is strapping up and can screw up and not holster it correctly. 500,000 times a day in however many schools, there's a teacher who could go crazy and shoot your kids. Every day. Just think about how many chances there are for this to go horribly wrong. And then if nothing happens, miraculously, we went through a whole day, 500,000 guns, nothing, nothing went wrong. We're doing it again the next day. And we're doing it again the next day. So much shit is gonna go wrong. How many teachers will look around at the world that underpays them and then answers the mass shooting problem with more guns and says, fuck it and kills themselves? Because the data says a lot a lot of these teachers are gonna kill themselves. How many teachers have an anger problem? Flip out, right? Fights going on, teachers losing their cool. Shit happens. Some teachers are pedophiles. Do you want them to have guns too? I mean, they should have the right to a gun because pedophilia is acceptable, if a bit weird. And even if we have perfect safety, right? Even if no teacher ever flips out, no teacher loses their gun, leaves it in the bathroom, no students find it or steals it from them, we're still introducing into the educational environment lethal force. Who was the worst teacher? The teacher you hated the most, the biggest dick, they had a gun now. You think that was gonna make school better? That's going to undermine the educational outcome for 80 million students. How's this? Kid brings gun in his backpack, right? First step, you pull it out in class, you shoot the teacher, and then you go to the teacher and take his gun, and now you have two guns. The shooter has the element of surprise, okay? You're not gonna stop all the school shootings. Most of these school shooters are trying to commit suicide anyway. So what deterrent is that? This happened two days ago. Now just look at all of these. Look at all of these. These, all these happened in the last 14 months. Do you have to take the gun out of the holster to poop? I don't, I don't know a lot about guns, as you can tell, but I don't think proximity to poop sets them off. Like, and these are cops. If you can't trust cops with all the training they allegedly do, uh, you're really gonna trust the training we're gonna 
just haphazardly do to teachers as a side hustle. Their side hustle is mass shooter stopper. You know what's really missing from the high school experience? Uh, getting shot because your teacher had to take a dump. You know, that would have been. So you're the big man of the house, right? You own a gun, gun to protect your family. You feel safer? You know who's not safer? Your wife. Yeah. You want a gun, you want to be the badass hero, but you won't get jealous. You won't shoot your wife when she tries to divorce you. You won't leave it in the bathroom at Arby's because you ate too much cheese. Kill yourself, never, you're too cool for that. None of these bad things will happen to you. Except that cool part where I stop a shooter, you know, serial killer comes for me and I'm so ready, bam. That might happen, but the suit, I would never commit suicide. None of these bad things. You're just like a teenager who thinks nothing bad will ever happen to you. So you're gonna drive hundred miles an hour for no reason. You're gonna put fireworks in your butt. Whatever dumb shit teenagers are doing, the only possible outcome is something cool. And they just don't think about any of the negative consequences. We have the data. You put a gun in your home, it's less safe. You might feel safer. You might feel more powerful. And you like feeling powerful, don't you? You like driving a big, big truck. You like owning a big gun. And those liberal cucks want to take away your manhood and make you weaker because they're weak little babies. But we have the data. It doesn't make you safer. It does definitely doesn't make your wife safer. So you tell me, is it facts or is it feelings? Are you triggered yet? Now that pepper, that's how you do propaganda, baby. Yeah, I don't give two shits about this. It's just whoever, you know, cutting me the checks. I'll tell you whatever. That militant homosexual agenda check cleared, so I'm, you know, they can put whatever words they want right in my mouth. You're being really weird. And then everyone in the school saw my tiny penis. Breastfeeding mom was a, no, it was a nightmare. He's ready to put the naughty man on a very long time out. How about the magical Uzi code? Well, this is one for the girls. Everyone laughed at me naked! Swipe your nose like a credit card. Hop on top, I want to ride. I do a Kegel while it's inside. Critics were going to attack the movie based on a perception of politics and a subject matter issue. Now, they'll hide it under the guise of creative whims or this or that, or they didn't uh, like the movie or the writing or whatever. But I call BS on that. Now, it's, it's tricky because I, I hate when directors are kind of like, you know, la lashing back on critics. 